through its faith, its steel, and its gunpowder, had the mighty empire of man weathered each and every storm set against it for two and a half thousand years. But the land that would become known throughout the old world as the Empire were not always the stalwart bastion of humanity they are today. They were once dark and dangerous, inhabited by squabbling chiefdoms that preyed on one another just as the world's nightmares preyed on them. But that was all to change with the rise of a single man, Sigmar Heldenhammer. This is his story. These long videos take forever to make, so please consider commenting, liking, and sharing. And if you want to live your own fantasy epic, try our sponsor, Gemstone Legends. It's a free Match 3 RPG, combining action, puzzles, and epic fantasy into a heroic quest suitable for anyone, available on Android and iOS. You and your dragon companions advance through battles by matching gems to perform actions, training up your heroes with new skills and gear as you progress through a non-linear campaign. You can also do PvP battles and raids. In particular, it's the kind of free game where free players are still fine to do this high-end content. It's also the kind of game you can play on and off, and one of our team members, Phoenix Red, has been doing so during commutes, or to have an easy wind-down ready to go any time with engaging battle mechanics and beautiful hand-drawn art and animations to enjoy. And reviewers seem to like it too. It's very highly rated on both Google Play and the Apple App Store. Install the game via our link in the description or the QR code on screen to get $50 worth of bonus items, including Moralia, a good healer hero that will keep you going through the entire game and makes getting started easy. Check it out now! Between 1,500 and 1,000 years before the creation of the Empire, the powerful, ancient but insular dwarves of the World's Edge Mountains began observing a mass exodus of agrarian human tribes into the lands between the World's Edge and Grey Mountains, where they fled in order to escape the predation of deadly enemies in the east. Over the next thousand or so years, these tribes gradually civilized establishing a number of petty barbarian kingdoms. But they were still easy prey for the numerous nightmares of the world. One of these tribes, whose fertile lands were nestled between the River Reich to the north and the Grey Mountains to the south, was known as the Unberrigans. With their capital at Reichdorf, the Unberrigans were, like most other human tribes during that age, a ferocious warrior people with brutal martial traditions and a brutal martial god to match. He was Ulrich, god of battle, winter, and wolves. Unberrigan settlements were assaulted constantly by chaotic beastmen warbands emerging from the deep dark forests, as well as warmongering greenskin hordes descending from the infested mountains. As though to compound the horror, fellow human tribes such as the Thuringians, Teutigans, and Merrigans would also routinely attack Unberrigan towns pillaging at will and taking away captives. It was in the year minus 30 IC, or Imperial Calendar, that Sigmar Unberrigan was born in the midst of a melee between the retainers of his father, King Bjorn, and an orcish raiding band, a melee which led to his mother Griselda's death. Sigmar thus came into the world with the sound of battle ringing in his ears, and the feel of both green skin and human blood on his infant body. Overhead flew the famous twin-tailed comet, foretelling the advent of a grand new epoch. This scion of the Unberrigan royal line rapidly began to prove his exceptional nature during childhood. When charged by the fearsome stallion-sized boar known as Black Tusk along the river Skyne, Sigmar alone of his hunting party boldly stood his ground in the face of imminent death. Rather than hunting the beast as initially intended, however, he instead showed immense character by dislodging a spear that had been stuck in the creature's back years before, ending its torment. Perhaps the most renowned of the young Sigmar's exploits came when a caravan of dogs from Karazakarak was assailed and captured by a force of greenskins in the Grey Mountains. Young Sigmar, still just a manling at the time, led a force of Enberrigan warriors to rescue the beleaguered dwarfs. Amid his assault on the Greenskin camp, he smashed through dozens of orcs and then slew their hulking warlord, Vagraz Headstomper, in single combat. In gratitude to the human, 
Dwarf King Kurgan Ironbeard of Karazakarak granted Sigmar the priceless runic warhammer of his age-old house, Galmaraz, Skull Splitter. Not long after returning victorious to Ragdorf with his legendary new weapon, Sigmar was called to stand before his proud father, together with his advisory council within the royal longhouse's great hall. As was tribal custom, Bjorn's heir was expected to earn his shield in battle upon reaching manhood at the age of 15. Luckily for the young warrior, yet another greenskin warlord named Grimgut Bonecrusher had stormed down from the southern mountains into Unberrigan territory, viciously ravaging the land and its people en route to a small settlement to the west called Astofen. Sigmar was ordered to ride south with half of Reichdorf's warriors, 300 in total, track and then put a swift end to the Greenskin Horde before it could inflict any further damage on the Enberrigan people. But he would not go alone. He had noble companions for company. Wolfgart was first, loyal and headstrong, always raring for a good fight. Second, Pendrag, a diplomatic, tactful and calming influence. Finally, Trinaventis was quiet, reserved and yet balanced in his council, a good compromise between two extremes. All were warriors born and bred. That evening, each warrior who was to venture out to fight the Greenskins the following morning assembled in the dwarf wrought Great Hall. In yet another Unberrigan custom, known as Blood Knight, the warriors enjoyed what might be seen as the Last Supper. They sat down beside their comrades to eat a lavish feast of fine meats, cooked specifically for the occasion. Ale was devoured entire tankards at a time, songs were sung, boasts of prior glories were made, and blood sacrifice offered to Ulrich. When the sun rose, the entire population of Reichdorf and their king Bjorn watched as the column of 300 mounted Unberrigan fighters, a 15-year-old Sigmar at their head, filed through the gates and vanished beyond the horizon. As the aging tribal ruler watched his prodigious son and heir march off on campaign, he remarked to himself, "'Tis the loneliest thing to be the leader of men in war." Only later did he think more of this, adding, "'Perhaps that is not true. Perhaps it is lonelier here as a father, waiting for his son to return home safely.'" Sigmar and his 300 blazed a trail southwest from Reichdorf, right along the bank of the Reich River. The band pushed down a track flanked by dark forest on both sides, occasionally passing by minuscule riverside settlements. Although these were Unberrigan lands, the disconnected forest dwellers were suspicious of strangers by nature, and upon seeing such a formidable party of armed men, kept a wary distance. Scouts were swiftly detached to get a measure of the terrain and their enemy, while Sigmar encamped maintaining strict quiet and refusing to light fires so that the orc mob would not become aware of them. After a tense night's rest, Sigmar, Wolfgart and Pendrag covertly ascended the hill to get a good bird's eye view of the situation in the light of day. Astofen was an assortment of tightly packed together huts, protected by an encircling wood stockade with guard towers at each corner. The besieged town lay within a bowl of craggy hills the eastern portion of which Sigmar's warriors were encamped behind. Its southern wall was further shielded by a bend in the nearby river. Half a league away from the town was a narrow stone bridge leading onto an open plain to the south, good country for mounted warfare. Sigmar observed carefully, believing the terrain to be conductive to an Umberrigan victory. However, the situation for the townspeople was growing extremely grim. Beyond their thoroughly inadequate palisade was a ramshackle mass of over 2,000 slaverings, howling greenskins, beating war drums and waving their savage choppers in the air. These monsters were ready to sack Astofen and tear every man, woman and child inside to pieces. Among their number were regular orcs, fearsome foes in their own right, together with smaller goblins who operated catapults and loosed volley after volley of flaming arrows into the flammable wood and thatched town. Most imposing of all were the mighty Black Orcs, alphas of the Greenskin race, and their massive chieftain Grimgut Bonecrusher, who led from the center of the throng. As Sigmar and his companions watched on, 
20 of the horde's greatest black orcs hefted a massive siege ram, shaped like a massive fist, towards the main entrance. Some brave men of Astofen braced the gate and extinguished the fires, while others threw spears from atop the wall. Despite inflicting casualties, it was clear that the greenskin war machines would get through eventually. Sigmar had to act fast, or the town and all its inhabitants would be unceremoniously butchered. Quickly returning to camp with a plan in mind, the Unberrigan warrior prince astutely selected Trinovantes, brave, measured and calm, to lead 50 grizzled volunteers around the outer hills, where they would take up an ambushing position on the far side of the Astofen Bridge. While this small detachment gradually eased their way around to the position Sigmar had pointed out, the main force of 200 to 250 Unberrigan cavalry formed up into two lines of battle. The first was led by Sigmar himself and were armed with spears, while the second under Wolfgart's command had recurve bows. Both deployed on the reverse slope of the eastern hill where the greenskins could not see them, waiting for Trinovantes' prearranged signal. The battle at Afstofen Bridge was about to begin. Time passed slowly. There was, as of yet, no sign of Trinovantes' readiness, nor any evidence of his presence whatsoever. Sigmar's attack could not go ahead until the signal was received, but the greenskins were squeezing Afstofen harder and harder by the minute. If the Unberrigans did not act soon, it would all be for nothing. Wolfgart, fiery as ever, vigorously pressed Sigmar to unleash them on the orcs, but the prince held him back. Trinovantes would pull through. As though to repay his blood brother's confidence, at that very moment, the bright green banner of Trinovantes was raised into the wind beyond the stone bridge. The signal had been given, and the trap was ready. With no further delay, Sigmar lifted his spear and shield to the heavens. As Wolfgart chanted the prince's name in a booming cry, Sigmar called out to those stalwarts who had accompanied him, Umberigans, we ride! Then, with an initial blast from Wolfgart's warhorn, the human warriors charged at a gallop over the crest of the hill. In beleaguered Afstofen, Sigmar's appearance on the hilltop was met with sheer elation. Salvation had come. The town's warriors fought with renewed vigour, pushing the greenskin menace back from the walls as best they could. Amid his warmongering rabble of orcs, Grimgut Bonecrusher roared and bellowed commands. Beaten and coerced by the warlord's biggins, half of the horde broke from the siege and formed a loose front line of long spears and primitive shields, through which Sigmar's brazen charge would have to punch. The onrushing tide of horsemen picked up speed as it raced down the slope towards the greenskin army. Behind the orcish spear wall, thin-limbed goblin archers loosed inaccurate and uncoordinated potshots, which mostly failed to hit their mark. When missiles did indeed strike one of Sigmar's cavalrymen, high-quality shields and armor, recently forged for them by the masterful Dorvan artificers of Karazakarak, succeeded in repelling most of the damage. Just prior to the point of impact, Sigmar and his hundred or so mounted and Berrigan warriors quickly changed tact, each throwing their heavy lance into the greenskin line with the force of a ballista bolt. An iron hailstorm of razor-sharp spear tips penetrated thick wooden shields, impaling the orcs holding them or simply slaying the odorous beasts outright. Dozens of greenskins fell in this initial barrage, but the cavalry were still set to impact. At the last possible second, however, each horseman wheeled around with peerless equestrian prowess and sailed away from the enemy line, ascending the slope once more. Bloodthirsty as always, and seeking to get into a proper fight with Sigmar's elusive cavalry, Grimgut's spear wall splintered slightly. As the Unberrigan first line peeled away from danger after an assault only seconds in length, Wolfgart's second rank bore down on the orcs seeking to frustrate the war-mad beasts even further. Sigmar's brazen comrade sounded yet another harsh note on his warhorn, and the cavalry under his command fired a small, precise storm of arrows into the orc ranks. Following Sigmar's example, Wolfgart and the mounted troops under his command wheeled and also darted back up the slope. The arrows found their mark almost universally. Some struck a bullseye, penetrating orcish skulls and felling their victims. 
but most merely stuck impotently into thick shields and the rough, leathery hide of the orcs. The irritating arrows were, however, not intended to destroy, but to annoy. At this latest denial of face-to-face -face melee, the greenskin shield wall heaved forwards, charging like berserkers in pursuit of the Unberrigan cavalry. The enraged orcs lobbed spears of their own at Wolfgart's retreating men, and several of them were knocked from their horses. When the onrushing greenskin tsunami reached these unfortunates, their cries of pain were mercilessly silenced by cleaver, axe, or an iron boot to the skull. Atop the hill, Sigmar let loose a bellow of fury upon witnessing these first casualties, but reformed and rearmed his line of horsemen all the same. Wolfgart did likewise when most of his own line reached the summit, forming up behind his friend. As the disorganized mass of muscled greenskins sprinted across the plain in battle rage, Sigmar let loose a horn blast and led his second charge of the day. Once more the Unberrigan cavalry picked up blistering speed as they descended the slope, reaching the level ground at full tilt. This time the riders did not wheel about, but thundered directly into the unruly orcs like the fist of Ulrich himself. Their front rank collapsed instantly upon receiving the charge. Sigmar impaled a greenskin warrior through the breastplate and pinned it to the ground before hefting Galmarez and smashing helmeted enemy skulls to splinters. But the cavalry maneuver was solely reliant on the weight of its initial impact. With that petering out, the numerically superior orcs began to recover with unnerving speed even as their front shattered, pushing back in their hundreds and bogging Sigmar's cavalry down in a rip and tear melee. The physically weaker humans could never win such a clash. Despite inflicting heavy casualties, here and there an Unberrigan warrior would get swarmed by orcs, encircled and dragged from their mount. For Sigmar, the time to enact the final stage of his plan had come. It was now or never. Two short sharp blasts sounded from the Unberrigan heir's horn, a signal that prompted the cavalry to disengage from the costly grinding melee. In ragged bands they rode hard to the south in the direction of Astoffen Bridge. Most of the survivors managed to escape the clash with only blunted weapons and shattered shields. Some, however, proved too slow off the mark and were seized, only to be brutally slain by their monstrous enemy. All in all, fully 150 of Sigmar's men managed to cross the bridge safely to reach the open plain beyond, where fresh weaponry had been arrayed for the men by Trinovantes. The replacements had been cunningly piled in a wedge formation, so that Sigmar's cavalry would be battle-ready by default even whilst rearming. Then, as the warlord Bonecrusher led his thousand orcs to swamp the humans, giant spear in hand, fifty of the most muscular and hefty and Berrigan warriors, clad in the heaviest dwarf-forged armor, marched from hiding places at either side of the bridge. These stalwart volunteers of Trinovantes' forlorn hope strode grimly onto the bridge, informed up ranks and assumed a blocking position on the bridge. Their job was simple hold the orcish horde at bay for as long as possible and give Sigmar enough time to reorder his cavalry. As the last of the battered human stragglers got beyond the river, Trinovantes raised his axe, kissed Ulrich's wolf icon with which it was inlaid, and shouted a defiant death rattle to his wall of armoured warriors. Umberigans, we march! With that last hurrah, the vanguard of the giant, battle-mad, greenskin mob slammed into Trinovantes' blocking force. Obstructed by the fast-flowing river and the narrow bridge, less fortunate orcs were forced to mass on the riverbank and behind their comrades, eagerly awaiting their turn in the meat grinder. Unberrigan spears were thrust by the dozen, punching through greenskin helmets and hitting back against the dark green flood. Still the sheer force of the assault was withering, and with each orc killed, two more came on bellowing. Trinovantes' fifty-strong contingent was slowly and bloodily being chipped away and forced back across the Astoffen Bridge. Half a league behind the nightmarish melee, Sigmar vigorously urged his cavalrymen to rearm as quickly as they could. The troops needed no such encouragement. Each and every one of them keenly recognized that this time was being purchased at a great cost the lives of their comrades and friends. 
a brief rest was had, fresh blades and shields were taken, and the cavalry remounted. At the slaughterhouse on the bridge, brave Trinovantes was holding the greenskins at bay and slaying vast numbers of them, despite being pushed back inch by inch. Unberrigan warriors were dying all along the front, savagely cut apart and crushed to pieces by the inhuman invaders. Sigmar's most level-headed companion slew several more orcs, but then warlord Grimgut Bonecrusher personally joined the fray. The chief greenskin found Trinovantes and impaled his giant spear through the captain's back. With that, the few remaining Unberrigan infantry broke, running for their lives and allowing the greenskins to spill out into the plain. Realizing that Trinovantes had just been slain by the fall of his green standard, Sigmar let out a grief-stricken howl at the head of his rejuvenated wedge of cavalry. Meanwhile the orcs, their cohesion broken to nothing by the exhilarating battle and an instinctive blood rage, uncontrollably fanned out on the south side of the bridge. With Galmaraz raised to the heavens, Sigmar and his 150 riders charged headlong at the greenskin rabble. The only one among their ranks who seemed to realize what was about to happen was Grimgut Bonecrusher himself, who desperately and unsuccessfully tried to bully his orc boys into some kind of defensive line. It was already far too late for the rampaging greenskins. After unleashing a final volley of spears and arrows, Sigmar's cavalry cleaved through the unformed herd like a hot knife through butter. Orcs, isolated or in small groups, died by the score, cut down by spear and axe, or trampled into the blood-soaked earth by ironclad hooves. The Unberrigan leader smashed his foe aside by the dozen, blazing a trail toward the center of the horde. When he got there, Sigmar brought Galmaraz down on Grimgut Bonecrusher's head and shattered the warlord's skull. That was the end of the battle. Deprived of their leader, every thread of unity binding the greenskin horde together tore apart. The creatures mindlessly turned on one another, brutalizing their own allies in a bid to escape first. Those orcs attempting to rush back across the bridge were met by the warriors of Astofen, who sallied out to push away the remaining besiegers and aid Sigmar's liberating band of heroes. Almost all of the 2,000 greenskins were killed, at the cost of around 100 in Berrigans. That night, the victors were hosted in Astofen as guests of honor by King Bjorn's cousin, Aethel, before riding back to Reichdorf in triumph. Not long after their return, Sigmar, who had earned his shield twenty times over, took his two remaining companions, Pendrag and Wolfgart, to the sacred oath stone around which Reichdorf was founded in ancient days. There Sigmar spoke to his companions of a great vision the feuding splintered tribes of humanity bound together in a single entity, an empire of man, with the strength to fend off greenskins or any other horror the world might spawn to assail its people. The Unberrigan prince held up Galmaraz and spoke the words, I swear by all the gods of the land and upon this mighty weapon that I will not rest until all the tribes of men are united and strong. In the aftermath of the triumph near Astofen in minus 15 IC, the Unberrigan civilization appeared to be on an upward track. Agricultural production was at a surplus, freeing the craftsmen to weave great tapestries, create lavish jewelry, and train their apprentices in these and a dozen other trades. Unberrigan forgers learned dwarven secrets in the crafting of fearsome new iron equipment, industry boomed, and warriors were sent to aid the allied Endel tribe of King Marbad. But there were also cracks in the armor. The brother of dead Trinovantes, a young swordsman known as Gereon, accused the prince of leading his sibling to death at Astofen. Moreover, he bristled that his sister Ravenna loved such a man and secretly formed a pact with the malevolent powers of chaos in the hope of getting revenge. But for several years yet, the pattern of regular life continued. Beastmen incursions were repelled, new warriors trained, and slowly but surely, the foundations for Sigmar's envisioned empire were laid. The course of history began to accelerate, when in minus nine IC, 
a deluge of desperate Cherisen refugees descended upon Reichdorf from the north. With them came emissaries from their king, Aloysius, and Kruger of the neighboring Teleuten tribe, bringing dire tidings. 6,000 demon-worshipping Norsi warriors had landed in wolf ships, cutting through all in their path. The envoys offered their monarchs sacred sword oaths to King Bjorn if he marched to war with them. Realizing the Chaos Marauders would come for his people next if he allowed his brother kings to fall, Bjorn accepted the plan, ordering Sigmar to remain behind while he went north with 3,000 men. Sigmar, although dissatisfied at being appointed to serve as regent in his father's stead, proved competent in the realm of administration. The young of his tribe began to receive education in history, geography and other fields, while a rotating farming system was instituted to give the people more time for other pursuits. However, the viper was ready to strike, and when Sigmar took his love Ravenna to a beautiful spot along the river Reich, Gerion attacked. In the struggle, Ravenna was killed and Sigmar, mortally wounded, sent floating down the river. In the north, Bjorn and the other monarchs attacked the Norsi army, with the Umberigan king slaying a red-armoured Chaos warlord at the direction of a witch, Graini, but suffering mortal wounds in return. In order to save Sigmar, who was on the very brink of death, Bjorn's spirit and that of his son ventured together in the purgatory of the Grey Vaults, where they fought the terrible demons of chaos for the fate of mankind. At the end of this ethereal clash, King Bjorn died and Sigmar woke in the company of his companions, his physical form having been found in the river by a fisherman. In minus six IC, the Unberrigan army returned to Reichdorf in a mourning triumph. A feast was held to honor the fall of Bjorn and the coronation of Sigmar, attended by rulers of tribes from far and wide. Among their number was the trident-wielding warrior queen of the Asabons, Freya, Krugar of the Talutans, Marbad of the Endels, Aloysius of the Cherusans, and Kurgan Ironbeard of Karazek Karak. It was at this raucous meeting that King Sigmar first proclaimed his dream of empire. Once Bjorn's tomb was sealed, the new Unberrigan ruler ordered a muster for the following year. Then, after the spring thaw of minus six IC, Sigmar led 3,000 warriors to launch a punitive expedition against the Norsi. En route, he called upon the sword oaths received from the northern kings and joined their forces with his own. Then the kings rose to the lands of the Udasis, where they rescued a beleaguered King Wulfilla of Udasis from the northern raiders. The Norsi were crushed in battle and then deviously permitted to retreat to the coast where their ships were incinerated when they attempted to sail away. With the campaign a success and Wulfilla now his firm ally, Sigmar bid farewell to his allies and marched south. Going via an alternate route by skirting the northern edge of the Middle Mountains, the Unberrigan king came to the mountaintop fastness of perhaps the most stubborn of his brother kings, Archer of the Teutagans. This king's power was in the ascendancy, just as Sigmar's was, and he had chosen to use that newfound power to ravage Unberrigan lands, particularly the settlement of Ubersreich, while declining to aid against the common Norsi foe. Sigmar decided it was time to knock Artur down a peg or two. The Teutagan monarch had grown arrogant atop his fortress pinnacle, the formidable Fauschlag Rock, and refused to come down to treat with the Umberrigan encamped outside his walls. Sigmar, delivering on a threat he had issued, personally climbed the sheer cliff face and crags before slaying Artur in single combat. By right of conquest, Sigmar thus claimed kingship over the Teutagans. Sigmar then went home again, arriving in the summer of minus 5 AC. There was barely time to rest before he leapt into action again. When summer cooled into autumn, Sigmar assembled a tribute caravan of the highest quality warhorses, weaponry and armor his people could produce. Bringing a small force along with him, the king marched into Azabon territory and delivered his gift to the flame-hearted warrior queen Freya. 
In return for such boons and for a night of passion with the Unberrigan king, the Asabon charioteers of the Eastern Plains became firm allies with Sigmar's people. The year after that, Sigmar joined battle with an army of recalcitrant Thuringian berserkers under their bellicose king, Otwin. Amid the fearsome clash, the ultimate outcome of which was never in doubt thanks to Unberrigan military prowess, Sigmar bested Otwin in single combat, just as he had bested Artur. The defeated Thuringian surrendered with the words, You have a heart of stone, King Sigmar, but by the gods you are a warrior to walk the road to Ulrich's hall with. With Otwin's sword oath now his, Sigmar returned home with the intent of resting a while. It was not to be. The same witch who had indirectly saved Sigmar through Bjorn now appeared to Sigmar directly. She warned the king of struggles to come, that followers of the Chaos Gods were provoking the Greenskins into a war that would be unequalled in its scale. It would be a war to eliminate everything Sigmar hoped to build before it could be. The only hope was for the unity of mankind, and for that to happen, Sigmar had to venture southeast by himself to the faraway lands of the mercantile Burgundians. Sigmar, now in his late twenties, arrived at the Burgundian capital of Sigurdheim after weeks of travel, and presented himself before the appropriately named King Sigurd. The ascendant warrior chieftain put forward his idea of unity and common cause against the evils of the world. Wily and always in the market for profit, Sigurd requested Sigmar's aid to rid his kingdom of a truly ancient evil, a monstrous dragon ogre, Skaranarak, a colossus of the primordial world. If the Unberrigan king succeeded, all the better. If he didn't, that was the removal of a possible rival. But when Sigmar ventured into the mountains and confronted Skaranarak, he smote the malicious creation with Galmaraz and put an end to its evil forever fulfilling his part of the oath. Sigmar's reward was yet another step towards the unification he so desperately desired for the race of man. Not only did Sigurd offer his sword oath in thanks, but so did the rulers of the two tribes over which he held suzerainty, Marcus of the Menegoths and Henroth of the Merigans. By the time the Unberrigan king reached Reichdorf, now a city rather than a mere town, in late Midas III IC, the Greenskins were already on the march. Ostergoth lands of King Adelhard in the northeast were being laid waste, while the Merigans and Menegoths were besieged in their great holdfasts by orc armies, who rampaged across the southeast with impunity. Realizing that Greiner's foretelling had been true, Sigmar raised forces from his brother kings and launched a campaign in the east. At last, in minus two IC, he confronted a great greenskin host at the Battle of the River Ava, halting its brutal advance at the cost of 10,000 warriors. That was just the beginning. Dorvan allies, who had been fighting a titanic host of greenskins for two years, reported that they were forced to pull back to defend their mountain holds, and were no longer able to prevent the orcish march east of the World's Edge Mountains ready to bring the world of men to a bloody end. Time was short, and so Sigmar summoned all of the rulers and warriors he had won to his side during the previous decade, Marbad, Aloysius, Kruger, Freya, Sigurd, and all the rest. Before spring came in minus one IC, the greatest army that the lands of men had ever seen gathered at Reichdorf, where the kings of the various tribes pledged allegiance to Sigmar, ready to confront the existential greenskin threat under his banner. The only tribes that refused this call to arms were the marsh-dwelling Jutonis and the Bretoni, who migrated across the Grey Mountains. The army of eleven realms marched east at a measured pace, reasoning that the snows had not yet thawed. Scouts were dispatched to discern precisely what the greenskins were up to. But panicked outriders returned with news that the orcs, united under the warlord Urgluk Bloodfang, and uncountable in number, were already en route to the Blackfire Pass, a crossing cut west to east through the World's Edge Mountains. The humans quickened their pace. 
the army of humanity managed to climb and block the narrowest two-mile-wide section of the pass before the Greenskins got there, and were joined by the dwarfs of King Kurgan. The ground before Sigmar's unified army was a rocky plain that gradually sloped on a downward incline, becoming even more uneven with each eastward step. That was the ground the Greenskins would have to climb to reach the army of men. To either flank were the progressively sloping valley sides, leading to the massive peaks of the World's Edge Mountains. They formed a barrier that would force the Orcs into a frontal assault, and render their overwhelming numbers far less relevant. There were also a number of boulders and outcrops scattered across the pass, between which Sigmar anchored the rock-solid linchpin of his army. These were the assorted line infantry of the many tribal monarchs who had accompanied him, together with the Unberrigan ruler's greatest foreign ally. There were Endel Slingers, Ostagoth Blademaster units, and Cherison Wildmen on the left, elite Unberrigan spearmen, stalwart heavily armed dwarves, and kilted Udossa warriors in the center, and the battle-tested warriors of the southeast, Brigundians, Merrigans, and Menegoths on the right. Deployed immediately in front of the primary battle line were the crack Unberrigan plate-clad cavalry, almost all armed with heavy lances. Only the infamous White Wolves unit, led by the king's personal bodyguard, Alfgear, refused to take up the lance, instead electing to wield heavy warhammers. To the flanks of this shock cavalry force were the famous skirmishing riders of the Talutan tribe, lightly armoured and armed with bows and spears. Behind the ranks of infantry were several archer blocks of the Cherisons and Unberrigans, ready to rain death on the Greenskins from afar. Sigmar also had two unconventional weapons at his disposal. Having pushed their way to the forefront of the army, beyond even the cavalry, were King Otwin and his drug-fueled Thuringian berserkers, arrayed in a loose line. Some wielded twin swords, others brutal axes, and other weapons of evisceration. Sigmar knew that he could not truly control these maddened warriors when the battle started, and made contingencies to use them in the best way possible. The second of Sigmar's wonder weapon contingents were several hundred magnificent Asaborn scythed chariots under the command of the king's flame-haired one-time lover, Queen Freya. Fully trained in the use of their vehicles, and armed with both bows and spears, they were initially deployed in front of the right flank. Behind the line in its entirety were a series of siege catapults, artillery designed to crush entire units of greenskin flesh into mulch. After a short time of waiting, a truly putrid stench struck the forces of mankind, blown in by easterly winds. It was the all too familiar reek of sweat, dung and rotten corpses. In other words, the greenskins were near. Just an hour following the army's deployment, the invading menace appeared, advancing up the valley in their hundreds of thousands and in relatively organized formations, for greenskins at least. The mass of this annihilating horde was made up of orc warriors, wielding rusted, blood-soaked choppers of all kinds and devious goblins flitting back and forth between the ranks. On the slopes to either flank were more goblins, mounted either on blood-maddened wolves or colossal spiders. Interspersed among the army were massive trolls, and above it rode its gargantuan warboss, Urgluk Bloodfang, atop his ferocious wyvern. The warboss swooped low above his innumerable army and raised his axe, wreathed in malign green flame, to signal the attack. It was followed by an ear-splitting cacophony of blood-mad orcish bellows, as the front ranks of the greenskin horde jogged in the direction of Sigmar and his defenders. Seeing their hated enemies on the move, Otwin and his Thuringian berserker host returned a shout of rage and then wantonly launched themselves at the orcs. Although numerically inferior to their savage foe, Otwin's unhesitating assault was ferocious without peer. His frothing berserkers, drunk on their herbal infusions, carved a deep wound into the greenskin vanguard, inflicting many times more casualties than they suffered. But they were suffering. Uncaring of the strategic situation, 
The Thuringians punched ever deeper into the Greenskin vanguard and were therefore swiftly surrounded. Beset on all sides, Otwin's assault force started taking massive losses. Observing the Thuringian king's struggle, Freya and her 200 Asaborn chariots barreled directly toward the enemy in a staggered line, unleashing volley after volley of lethally accurate arrows as they went. The warrior queen's orders from Sigmar were clear, help relieve Otwin by any means necessary, and she would do just that. After inflicting a great deal of damage with bow and arrow, the Asaborn Scythe's chariots wheeled around in perfect order and sped along the greenskin line, ripping the enemy apart with their blades, while the riders thrust and threw spears. At the same time, Sigmar and his trusted companions Wolfgart and Pendrag led the elite and Berrigan heavy cavalry in a full-scale charge, crashing into the mass of greenskins that had encircled the Thuringians with lances couched. Sandwiched between the cutting blade of Freya's scythe chariots and the crushing hammer that was Sigmar's cavalry charge, and bombarded by arrow volleys from behind the human line, the greenskin vanguard broke. Its wounded and scattered survivors retreated in disorder back to their main line. The second orcish advance was now beginning. Unlike the previous probing attack, this time the warboss's horde pushed forward en masse across the entire width of the pass. On the flanks and the slopes, goblin wolf and spider riders moved toward the lighter Talutan cavalry and assorted skirmishers manning Sigmar's wings. A force of heavy green-skinned chariots, crude imitations of their elegant Asaborn counterparts, and pulled by massive boars, shot out of the main horde straight at the Burgundians. Some were sent careening into rocks by archery fire and destroyed, but most of the ramshackle vehicles smashed into King Sigurd's ranks. The greenskin vehicles struck deep into the Burgundians, slashing through rank after rank of their ordered warriors. The line convulsed, wrapped around the orcs, and slew them in short order. But the beleaguered warriors were unable to reorder their formation before another dreadful weapon was unleashed against them. Greenskin artillery let loose, launching titanic boulders at Sigmar's right center in a concentrated barrage and crushing dozens of men with each strike. Provoked to panic by the terrifying rain of missiles, a great many Burgundians routed, opening ragged holes in the army of mankind before contact was even made. Adroitly reacting to the potential danger, King Kurgan Ironbeard shifted a portion of his stout dwarven warriors over to cover the gap. Signaled to do so by Sigmar, Wulfilla of the Udasa strode to Kurgan's side with his own kilted fighters, driving his standard into the ground as a statement of intent. There would be no retreat from that spot. Wulfilla would either triumph or die. Sigmar's formation stabilized in the nick of time. As the gulf slammed shut between the dwarves and Udasa, the two armies clashed. As though scenting weakness in the recently patched wound in Sigmar's line, the greenskin menace assaulted it with especially savage ferocity. The defenders were more than up to the task. The dwarven soldiers of Kurgan, whose race had been blood enemies of the orcs for uncounted centuries, fought with cool efficiency, methodically culling each foe without quarter. To their side, Wolfilla's warriors fought just as effectively, cutting the greenskin push to pieces with massive broadswords. All along the width of Blackfire Pass, the races of orc and human fought in a desperate struggle for the fate of tomorrow. In just the first minutes of combat, virtually all of the first ranks of both sides were chewed up by the merciless melee before the central clash ground to a bloody stalemate. It was on the flanks where the first true breakthrough came. On Sigmar's extreme right, King Marcus came under sustained assault by ravening packs of goblin wolf riders. These grim warriors of the invaded southeast realm of the Menegoths had suffered much at greenskin hands during the previous year's war, and so simply lowered their spears in good order and met the oncoming wolves with glacial calm. Here and there a wolf would get through, brutally killing its unfortunate victim, but the vast majority were impaled on iron spear tips, mauled by the king's hunting hounds, or otherwise destroyed. 
as though revenging the annihilated wolf riders, colossal greenskin war engines began bombarding the Menegoths with a deadly and concentrated hailstorm of massive iron javelins, every one cleaving through a tightly packed spear formation and reaping a terrible toll of warriors. Although courageous in the face of a terrible enemy, this airborne death was more than the Menegoths could take, and they began running for their lives. All of a sudden, the character of the battle changed. Sniffing blood in the water, the greenskin advance instinctively drove towards this newly opened weak point, angling the line like a hinge on a gate which was the solid left flank and center of Sigmar's army. The situation of Sigmar's right was getting worse by the second. Without the Menegoths on their extreme flank, their Merrigan allies received a fresh assault from both the front and the sides. It was clear that their resistance would falter sooner or later, and it was up to Sigmar to act before it did. Unberrigan and Endel reinforcements, led by Sigmar, counterattacked, reversing the course of the battle there and stabilizing the right flank at the cost of King Marbad's life. Despite yet another small triumph, it was becoming increasingly clear to Sigmar that there was absolutely no hope of victory. All of mankind's bravery and skill, considerable as it had been, would be swamped beneath the inexorable greenskin tide. There was only one path to victory now. It is said in legend that Sigmar leapt without hesitation into the central mass of orcs. Gal Maraz, thrumming with ancient magical energies, crushed and bludgeoned greenskins by the dozen. Even the famously belligerent orcs scrambled to be away from this titan of war, opening up a great empty circle around Sigmar. At the same time, the army of mankind, inspired by the prowess of its leader, launched a final desperate charge. It would never be enough, but Sigmar's rampage had its intended effect. Drawn to the greatest warrior on the battlefield like a moth to a flame, Urgluk Bloodfang descended on his wyvern, which he ordered to devour Sigmar outright. Despite suffering wound after wound at the hands of the greenskin warlord and its baleful mount, Sigmar's hammer slew the great beast, bringing Urgluk to personal combat in the sight of both armies. The vile colossus managed to seize Sigmar and almost crushed his skull, but the king found an opening, seized Galmaraz, and, as he had done at Astofen Bridge fifteen years before, crushed his adversary's skull to dust. Like a formidable but fragile archway whose keystone had been removed, the Greenskin Horde, deprived of its all-powerful war boss, and faced by what appeared to be a human god of war, fell apart and routed. Even as the bruised army of mankind continued its renewed charge, individual orc captains turned on one another like the beasts they undoubtedly were, jostling for command or to be first out of danger. Asaborn chariots and the army's cavalry ran down thousands more greenskins until sunset, while the remainder scattered into the badlands of the east. The Battle of Blackfire Pass was won. Celebration and relief fused with sorrow and grief. The enormity of such a victory was hard to take in, but so much had been sacrificed to achieve it. As the pyres of a great funeral celebration and relief fused with sorrow and grief. The enormity of such a victory was hard to take in, but so much had been sacrificed to achieve it. As the pyres of a great funeral ceremony burned to send King Marbad and all the fallen warriors to Ulrich's hall, the surviving monarchs of men knelt at Sigmar's feet as one, proclaiming him the rightful emperor of the newly founded Empire of Man, the people and lands of which owed their survival to him. As though the gods of men had rewarded their faithful for destroying the greenskin invaders at Blackfire Pass, the year after that climatic battle proved an auspicious one. The often savage winter months were mild, the summer warm and pleasant. As a result, the crop harvest ranked among the most bountiful in living memory. It was this year, the first of the imperial calendar, that marked Sigmar's formal coronation as emperor. Upon receiving his dwarf-forged crown, 
Sigmar declared the old title of king to be abolished. No king should be subject to another's rule. Instead, the tribal rulers were declared the counts of the empire, each retaining their lands and rights as sword-oathed vassals in perpetuity to Emperor Sigmar. Reichdorf, ancestral capital of the Emberigan tribe, would serve forever as capital, a beacon of hope and learning where all men, from warriors to scholars, would gather to further the advancement of mankind. Sigmar's foremost bodyguard, Alfgir, received the title of Grand Knight of the Empire, while shrewd Pendrag was ordered to march north to take up the title Count of Middenheim. This peaceful period did not last long. Soon after his coronation, Sigmar and his companions rode west in response to rumours that the Endel Lord, Aldred's lands, were afflicted by a malignant sickness. After a period of investigation, the Emperor revealed the Count's advisor to be a Chaos worshipper in service to demons of the nearby marsh. He defeated the threat, executed the traitor, and ensured Aldred's loyalty. Uncounted threats still bore down on the Empire. News continuously poured into Reichdorf from the north, warning of Norse raids, perpetrated by forces under a warlord, Cormac Bloodaxe. Asaborn chariot warbands brought tales of ruined villages in the eastern foothills, destroyed by resurgent greenskin bands. In the south, Menegoth lands still suffered under assault from greenskins, trolls, and ratmen, and everywhere did mutated beastmen attack and raid the lands of men. Sigmar assembled the counts to discuss the dangers, and directed their fury at the final recalcitrant tribe the Gitones of Marius. Unable to stand against the United Empire, Marius retreated to his seaboard capital of Jutonsric in year four of the imperial calendar and settled in for a siege. Only after two more grueling years did Sigmar seize his clifftop fortress, the Namathir, and bend the Jutone ruler to his will. As ever, Sigmar could not afford to celebrate his victory for very long before a threat in the north demanded the Emperor's attention. In the sixth year of his imperial reign, Count Pendrag sent for aid, and, all too happy to see his comrade again, Sigmar trekked up to Middenheim with a force of warriors. On arrival, it became obvious that something was terribly wrong. The Norsi were again growing bold in their raiding, but far worse was the looming dark presence of a nameless horror emanating from the Middle Mountains. Many warriors and Templars were already missing after seeking the evil out, and the situation was becoming serious. In search of this budding nightmare's black heart, Sigmar and his companions ventured into the mountains and eventually came across the imposing Brass Keep. There, the Emperor and his warriors confronted an awakened necromancer known as Morath, remnant of a lost and infamous Kingdom of Death known as Morcain. The clash against his legions of risen dead proved horrifying, but Sigmar cast the profane sorcerer down and seized from him a mysterious golden jeweled crown, possessing incredible power. But as the near skeletal necromancer faded from life in the Emperor's grip, he is said to have muttered the ominous words, No, you promised as if the wretch were speaking to someone only he could see. It was a dire warning Sigmar did not heed. With the new crown on his brow, the Emperor left the Middle Mountains and immediately encountered Udase refugees from the north. The news, as ever, proved grim. Norse marauders and their Ropsmen allies had murdered Sigmar's friend, Count Wolfilla, burning his lands and massacring thousands of innocents in the process. Such atrocities could be expected of the chaos-worshipping northern raiders, but Rop's men participation came across to Sigmar as a grievous betrayal. Motivated by a vicious rage that was only partly his own, the Emperor set out to enact severe punishment. Upon reaching Rop's men territory, Sigmar fought and won three battles against the tribal armies, inflicting devastating casualties. In any other circumstance, that would have been enough but Sigmar refused to relent. What ensued was tantamount to the merciless genocide of an entire people, 
villages turned to ashes, prisoners executed, and families murdered without hesitation. Rumors spread that Sigmar could be heard at night crying out in his sleep, as though in the grip of an infinite nightmare. Sigmar's elite warriors caught their monarch whispering nonsensical words under his breath, as though he too was speaking to some unseen presence. He became more paranoid, sadistic, violent and cynical, a far cry from the idealistic optimist of his younger days, inspiring discontent in the other counts. If Sigmar could perpetrate such acts on one tribe, why not on them? Six weeks later, the Emperor marched through the gates of his capital, where he was met by Count Kruger. Sigmar took his subordinate to a jail, where he angrily revealed Aloysius. Both men had refused to cease their internecine squabbling when ordered. As punishment, they were both to be executed. But when Sigmar raised his blade to strike the first man, his greatest companion Wolfgart emerged from the mist and confronted him. The two men argued, Wolfgart beseeching his friends to see reason. This tyrant was not him. When that didn't work, Wolfgart attacked and the two men fought a brutal struggle in the mire. Eventually, something within Sigmar gave in and realization struck him. The Emperor ran deeper into the marsh, fighting an internal battle with the destructive magical force within the crown atop his head. This voice offered everything, all the world under Sigmar's benevolent control, his love restored to life and his every ambition fulfilled. The Emperor declined, ripping the crown from his head and dispelling its baleful influence over him. Sigmar sealed the crown away, but its guiding presence had shown him something else in its ensnaring attempt. Wolf ships in their hundreds prowled the northern seas, readying an apocalyptic invasion to try and complete what the Greenskins had started half a decade earlier. In year six of the Imperial calendar, Cormac Bloodaxe attacked the Empire, inflicting the Emperor's first defeat, but not managing to destroy his army. The war culminated at the Siege of Middenheim, where the Emperor once again confronted the enemy commander, now a demon prince of Khorne, in personal combat, defeating him. As mankind, bloodied and weary, convalesced in the aftermath of the Norsi assault, the Clock of Doom finally struck twelve. The catastrophe began in the extreme south, where the dour Menegoths were all but annihilated by an army of the risen dead. Then they too were raised from their early graves, fodder for a new and unflinching army. From this time, affected by malevolent sorcery, corpses within the barrows and crypts of the Central Empire began to awaken and assault the living. The first knowledge Sigmar gained of this new atrocity came in the form of a single Arabian emissary. This man, in truth a millennia-old vampire called Khaled al-Muntasir, came before Sigmar bearing a message from his master, Nagash. When the name was mentioned, a mixture of terror and disbelief spread throughout the hall. To Sigmar's twelve tribes, Nagash was little more than an evil legend, a story told by mothers as a warning to their children at bedtime. But the ancient necromancer king was indeed real. He desired one thing above all, his crown of sorcery. Sigmar declined. To grant this monster his wish would damn the entire world. And just like that, the war against the dead began. Engorged by the masses of the Menegoth dead, and aided by the newly made vampire Count Marcus, Nagash's corpse army surged north into Brigandian territory with absolutely nothing capable of standing in its way. The sorcerer's undead legions first scoured the land, then descended on a thoroughly unprepared Sigurdheim. Of the city's population, numbering almost 8,000, only 12 survived to carry news of this north. Among the casualties was Count Sigurd, who followed Marcus's fate and was transformed into a vampire. At the same time, Nagash's armies had managed to surround and isolate the various strongholds of the Merrigans to the southwest. They held on, a few shimmering specks of light drowning in a sea of darkness, but they held on. 
as Nagash prepared to advance on Reichdorf and secure his ancient crown. He unleashed a deadly pincer assault, designed to tie down imperial forces and stop them from coming to the emperor's defense. In the imperial territories of the north, risen dead gradually coalesced into titanic hordes that blockaded Middenheim and Talheim, cutting the cities off and preventing their warriors from marching to Sigmar's aid. In the west, a flotilla of several hundred warships assaulted Jutonsrik and scoured Marius's recently subjugated mercantile capital of all life. The Count managed to withdraw east with a small number of refugees and warriors in the hope of gaining asylum with Endel Chief Aldred. The dead were not far behind and quickly besieged Marburg, which resisted fiercely. To the far northeast, the semi-nomadic Ostagoths fought a hit-and-run war against the dead armies. Finally, at Nagash's command, Khaled al-Muntasir led a force of several thousand cadaverous warriors and beasts north to confront the ferocious Asaborns. Not only would this deprive Sigmar of yet another vital ally, but a wave of terrified innocents would be driven toward Reichdorf, causing chaos. The vampire general was successful at first, defeating and absorbing Queen Freya's force near the river Ava, but the fiery warrior managed to escape. He then drove directly at the Asaborn capital of Three Hills, where Freya's right hand, Mabe, together with a Dorvan contingent, fought a desperate last stand, outnumbered eight to one. Defeat was imminent, until Sigmar, Wolfgart, and a large force of Imperial reinforcements arrived, taking Almuntasir completely by surprise. As he tended to do, the Emperor went straight for the lead vampire, but the blood drinker fled the field and rode south to rejoin his lord. The small undead force was completely destroyed, and the victorious army of mankind returned to the imperial capital, ready to defend against Nagash. With his crushing multitudes swollen by imperial dead, numbering into the tens of thousands, the millennia-old Nehekaran sorcerer lord finally bore down on Reichdorf in the year 15 imperial calendar. His army halted outside the walls, willing to grant Sigmar one final, generous chance at undying glory. Loath to treat with such lesser beings himself, Nagash sent Khaled al Muntasir, together with both Marcus and Sigurd, to secure the crown of sorcery without need for a battle. Basking in Sigmar's horror at the fate of his now vampiric comrades, Muntasir gave him a choice. Reichdorf and every man, woman, and child in it would die no matter what, but they could either choose to concede and be reborn in glory or be resurrected as maddened creatures of unending hunger and torment, only after ravening corpse-eater beasts had defiled and mutilated their cadavers. Tough choice, Wolfgart said sarcastically. Can we think about it? Humor being anathema to him, Khaled simply declared that they had until the moons rose to decide and rode off. That night, Sigmar, the warriors at his disposal, and the civilian population of the imperial capital emerged from the ruined Ostgate onto the hard-packed flat ground between two forks of the River Reich, terrain suitable for cavalry attacks. The Emperor and his Great Hall Guard cavalry manned the centre-right, while his prime bodyguard Alfgear commanded the White Wolves on the centre-left. Flanking both cavalry divisions, were units of heavily armed Unberrigan infantry, armed with spears and shields. Sigmar's right flank, anchored on the southern fork of the Reich, was manned by a paltry dozen Asaborn chariots led by Queen Freya, her bodyguard the Queen's Eagles, and a greater quantity of Asaborn infantry. Across the field, on the northern arm of the Reich, rode a division of Count Kruger's Teluton Red Scythe skirmishing cavalry some of the most skilled horsemen in the entire empire. The Talutan ruler himself was not present, having dispatched the scythes from besieged Talheim. Instead, his troops were led by Leoden. At most, Sigmar's army, including civilians and 100 dwarves in reserve, numbered no more than 15,000. As far as a slavering mass of undead corpses, beasts and monstrosities can have order, Nagash's army did. To counter the highly mobile forces on Sigmar's right, 
Nagash concentrated his corpse-eater beasts and wolves on that side of the field, together with a unit of heavily armoured skeletal knights in reserve. It was led by Sigurd. The centre, spearheaded by Marcus, was almost solely made up of regular undead. Regular undead also comprised Nagash's right, together with a skeletal knight unit and his secret weapon, the fallen hulking chaos champion Krell. The necromancer king himself was on a hill near the rear of his army. Although the Dorvan contingent and civilians stayed where they were, the frontline forces of mankind launched a charge along the entire front. A cold rain continuously soaked the battlefield, transforming the wet ground near the rivers into a quagmire. That didn't prevent the first impact. From Sigmar's left to his center right, the first ranks of undead chaff caved with little resistance, allowing them to drive deep into Nagash's army. On the right, however, difficulties began almost immediately. Although inflicting harsh losses on the dead things opposing them, Asabon chariots and infantry found themselves easy prey for the specially placed flesh eaters and death wolves. The battle near the Southern Fork descended into a nightmarish, disorganized melee, just as the undead preferred. At the heart of the fight was Freya, whose great chariot shattered into splinters when it was attacked by a titanic wolf. The queen survived, and according to her, had never felt more alive. On the left, Leoden's red scythes drove deep into the undead ranks, but received a direct counterattack from both the heavily armored corpse knights and Krell. Under vicious assault from this rampaging demigod of war, the Telutans suffered heavy casualties, dying ten at a time from Krell's devastating axe blows. As it seemed as though the left flank would collapse, Alaric the Mad and his hundred dwarves marched into the fray, blowing Krell's head to pieces with a novel invention, the Black Powder Cannon, stabilizing the area. As it seemed Queen Freya's Asaborns would collapse under a renewed Black Knight assault, a disgrace 12-year-old boy called Daigle, whose cowardice caused a prior defeat, personally led the ragtag civilians of Reichdorf into battle against the undead throng assailing Freya. His intervention there stabilized the right at the cost of many civilian lives, and also managed to push away Sigurd, who had been heavily injured in the desperate fight. In the center right, Alfgear dueled and eventually managed to slay Count Marcus, but was badly wounded in the process. The tenacity of his army allowed Sigmar to push onwards towards Nagash. His patience gone, Nagash called upon a burst of dreadful magic and resurrected the dead inside Reichdorf and on the battlefield. The army of mankind began to rout back to the city at this new terror, but Sigmar's advance had now reached the undead lord. At the same time, several thousand unexpected berserker reinforcements under Otwin and Sigmar's bodyguard Redwain arrived from Middenheim, slamming into the undead army from the north. The final battle began, and Sigmar, who once again wore the crown of sorcery on his head, attacked Nagash directly. The two colossi of war fought a great battle, but the Emperor then carelessly tossed the crown and swung Galmaraz down, aiming to shatter the malignant creation. The calculated maneuver worked like a charm. Nagash, rapidly obsessed with regaining the all-powerful artifact and the undeniable power within it, lurched forward and reached for the crown. In doing so, the necromancer rendered himself vulnerable and allowed Sigmar to instead bring Galmaraz down in a thunderous overarm blow which, powered by ancient runic arts, obliterated the dark sorcerer completely. In an instant, the animating force powering Nagash's armies fell away. They simply stopped. Victory had been won. In the battle's calm aftermath, forces from the west brought news that Marburg had survived. Its rightful Count Aldred, however, lay unfortunately dead. A month after Nagash's defeat on the River Reich, the wily Marius and Aldred's cunning sister Marika joined hands in marriage, uniting the Jutoni and Endel peoples. Sigmar personally blessed the union. However, rumors persisted that Aldred had fallen not to the undead, 
but to an opportunistic conspiracy between the newlyweds amid the chaos of Marburg's siege. After all, Nagashi's assault had left Jutonsrik a smoking ruin, and Marius needed greener pastures to call his own. Sigmar's dwarven allies, including his friend Alaric the Mad, finally returned to their mountain homeland after years of service in Reichdorf. Sigmar's only remaining sword brother Wolfgard settled down with his Asaborn wife and children, splitting his time between the imperial capital and three hills. Freya, gravely injured by Sigurd during the battle, also returned to Three Hills to rebuild what had been lost. Finally, Sigmar sent a high priestess far, far to the east, bearing the crown of sorcery, so that the dread artifact might never be found by the wrong people again. And here is where our sources detailing the ancient life of Sigmar Heldenhammer come to an abrupt end. Scattered and potentially unreliable texts reveal that the First Emperor may have ruled mankind in relative quiet for several further decades, punctuated only by another incursion from the forces of chaos 15 years after Nagash's defeat. We're just not sure. However, in around 50 Imperial Calendar, an elderly Sigmar awoke one day and left his empire, venturing to the World's Edge Mountains alone. He was never seen again. In his wake, the Counts elected Cedric, whose first act was to institute the system of Elector Counts, setting the stage of imperial history for millennia to come. As the First Emperor's life became a legend and then myth, his reputation grew greater and greater until Sigmar became revered as a god in his own right. Don't forget you've got a chance to start playing Gemstone Legends with $50 worth of gifts, including the hero Moralia, if you get the game now via our link in the description or QR code. Thank you for watching our video on the life and battles of Sigmar. These long videos take forever to make, so please consider commenting, liking and sharing. Right now we're working on our series on the end times of this universe and we'll continue talking about Warhammer Fantasy and other fantasy, sci-fi, space opera and alternative history universes in the future, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. We'll try to read every comment as we want to see what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. Your feedback is very important to us. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.